So let's dive a little bit deeper into the DAM ID technology. And so in the DAM ID assay, you run a pair of experiments. In the first experiment, you create a fusion protein between DAM and lamin B1. And what's going to happen is that all, all of the adenines that are uh, within a GETC motif that also tends, that is also residing near the nuclear lamina where the lamin B1 protein uh, resides is going to get methylated. Uh, in the second uh, experiment, what you're going to do is you express the DAM protein domain uh, on its own, and then the adenine in the GATC motif, uh, in theory anywhere in the genome, uh, not just the regions associated with the nuclear lamina, will also get methylated. And so the key point here is that a methylated adenine uh, occurs relatively rarely in most eukaryotes. And so what you can then do is that uh, in both the foreground and the control experiment, you can use uh, specific restriction enzymes that recognize uh, methylated adenine uh, and will cut at the methylated adenine. Uh, will then allow you to uh, isolate and identify regions of the genome uh, that have that uh, adenine methyl group. And because again, it's that methylation event rarely happens in eukaryotes, then wherever you see those reads mapping is basically will tend to correspond to regions that are associated with the nuclear lamina in the foreground experiment or anywhere in the genome in the case of the control experiment. And so just like with ChIP-seq, by comparing where your reads land in your foreground versus your control experiment, you can get an idea of which regions of the genome are uh, associated with the nuclear lamina in your cells that you targeted. So once you get your reads from your foreground and control experiment for DAMID, what you can then do is uh, you can intuitively plot uh, your distribution of reads across the genome. So here, the x-axis represents chromosomal position, and the y-axis represents the log two ratio of reads uh, mapping to a particular genomic location uh, in the foreground divided by the background. And so what that means is that the value of zero means that you see uh, about the same number of reads from both your foreground and your control experiment. And so there's no uh, particular enrichment for lamin associated uh, regions. Uh, if you see very strong positive values, then that indicates that there is uh, potential for enrichment of uh, lamin associated domains and negative means that it's not likely to be a lad. And so here, basically I've indicated using yellow boxes um, where potential LAD calls would be across the genome. Um, and so basically, intuitively, you can't, you wouldn't really call a LAD every time you see a little spike above zero because um, there is noise in where the mapping occurs. And so um, generally speaking, LADs are only really called where you see a whole region of a chromosome um, where the values are all above zero. Um, but here's an example of uh, some potential LAD calls for one region of a chromosome. And so from these LAD calls across the entire genome, you can basically come up with some kind of uh, hypothetical model of which regions of the genome are associated with the lamin. Um, and so one of those possible models is shown here on the bottom, where uh, basically yellow regions of the chromosome are uh, used to indicate where the regions that are associated with the nuclear lamina is. Um, those little black lines, the short little black lines represent H3K27 trimethylation, which is an epigenetic mark of uh, basically heterochromatin, um, or basically transcriptionally inactive regions of the genome. And you can see, generally speaking, that uh, K27 trimethylation sits near, for example, uh, LADS in the genome. And so uh, there's been a lot of work trying to characterize what exactly uh, LADs or again lamin associated domains uh, represent in the genome. And so what you can do is you can take, for example, uh, the set of all regions that are called as LADs uh, from your DAMID experiment, and you can essentially align them. And so by align, what I mean is that LADs occur all throughout the genome. But what you can do is you can basically take each LAD and you can line them up, such you know, line them up 
uh, such that their starting position is the same. So that's represented by the dashed black line. And once you line them up, then you can draw plots like the one I'm showing you here on the bottom, where uh, basically the plot at zero on the x-axis represents the starting point of a lad. And so therefore the uh, sequence to the left basically represents this sequence upstream of the start side of the lad. And the sequence to the right um, of zero basically represents the region immediately downstream of the start of the lad. And so by aligning these lads such that you are looking at features of the genome relative to the starting point of a lad, you can basically start to identify um, interesting features about lads. Um, and so um, if you look at this plot on the bottom, for example, uh, what the uh, y-axis represents is the log two, um, essentially log two ratio of how many reads, for example, you find in your uh, foreground dam ID experiment relative to the um, relative to background or your control experiment. And as you'd expect, because lads are called based on an enrichment of reads in your uh, foreground experiment, basically you'll see you see a big spike in uh, the amount of like log two lamin association uh, of the genome to two lamin, basically right where the lad starts. So people have generally uh, spent a lot of time characterizing what kinds of genomic features are associated with LADS uh, compared to regions of genome outside of LADS. And so generally speaking, regions uh, inside of LADS are generally uh, gene poor. Uh, the genes that are within LADS tend to be more poorly expressed than genes outside of LADS. There's a lot of epigenetic marks that are generally associated with inactive transcription uh, found within the LADS. And more interestingly, in terms of the boundaries of the LADS, so the junction between uh, LADS and non-LAD domains, uh, you'll tend to find a lot of, for example, like CTCF binding sites or CPG islands, uh, and even promoters of genes uh, that are pointing in the direction opposite of the LAD. So they're the genes are facing outwards with respect to the LAD boundaries. And so basically the conceptual model people have, uh, one of the conceptual models that people have come up with in terms of LADs are that basically LADs are one way of organizing chromosomes in the nucleus. And they are generally um, associated with low gene density, low gene expression and chromosome inactivity. Um, and more specifically, the boundaries of these LADs tend to be enriched in CPG islands, CTCF binding sites, as well as promoters that uh, promoters that are associated with genes outside of the LADs, as opposed to promoters that are associated with genes inside the LADs. So in this lecture, we mainly talked about using DAMID for the purposes of uh, identifying associations between lamin and uh, nearby genomic regions. Uh, it's worth pointing out that DAMID is actually pretty flexible and so you can use it for a wide range of uh, of assays. And so for example, you can fuse the DAM protein domain to, in theory, any transcription factor uh, that binds DNA and therefore identify potential binding sites of uh, any given transcription factor. Um, this of course has all the limitations that we discussed with respect to creating fusion proteins between TFs and uh, certain epitope tags that you could use to do chip seq with. Um, in addition, of course, because DAM only recognizes adenine uh, in the GATC motif, this means that you won't actually be able to identify binding sites of TFs that aren't near that GACT motif. Uh, part B of this figure shows that you could create a fusion protein between, uh, for example, our, uh, components of RNA pull 2 uh, with DAM so that you can then kind of observe uh, where transcription is happening uh, because basically you'll see methylated uh, adenines near in the GATC motif wherever RNA pull 2 is, uh, is transcribing. Part C just illustrates that um, DAM has a strong preference for uh, methylating accessible adenines in the GATC motif and so uh, basically GATC motifs that exist in uh, in like regions of the genome that are wrapped up in histones, for example, are much less likely to be methylated 
And so in some sense, you can use DAM to uh, try to identify open chromatin regions, which are, again, kind of associated with generally active transcription. Uh, part D just illustrates that um, you can even use DAM to identify some types of RNA-DNA interactions. And so one type of epigenetic regulation is uh, what's called R-loop formation, which is basically when um, RNA uh, actually forms a uh, hybrid duplex with DNA. So you get an RNA-DNA duplex. And so the formation of this duplex can be associated with, for example, transcriptional repression. Um, and so if you want to identify where this uh, R-loop formations are happening, what you can do is you can take your RNA of interest, uh, you can engineer a what's called an MS2 take, which is basically a stem loop secondary RNA structure. And this MS2 tag can basically be rec recognized by a protein domain called the uh, MCP coat, or sorry, the uh, MS2 coat protein. Uh, labeled as MC2 or MCP. And so if you create a fusion protein between MCP and DAM, basically wherever this MS2 take forms, um, then you'll basically uh, have DAM uh, methylating adenine in the GATC motif. And therefore that will give you some indication as to uh, R-loop formation. Part E of this diagram just shows that you can actually uh, use DAM to uh, detect interactions between transcription factors. So for example, uh, DAM is, again, it's a protein domain that forms a 3D structure. And so you can, in essence, split the DAM domain in, say, two, such that uh, basically uh, if either half of DAM, and basically if you uh, create fusion proteins where half of DAM is fused to one TF and the other half is fused to another TF, then basically DAM will only be active if both halves are uh, proximal to each other on the genome, which will only happen if uh, TF1 and TF2 are co-located and bound to their uh, proper DNA binding sites nearby on the genome. And so basically part F also illustrates that if you create a fusion protein between uh, some transcription factor and DAM, for example, you can sometimes detect uh, not just uh, methylated adenines near local binding sites of the TF, but if the TF is assisting in, for example, causing uh, loop formations, all right, looping in your genome, then basically you should also see uh, methylated adenines in the region that is kind of looped around uh, and brought close to the, for example, promoter, uh, just because of you know those uh, those adenines in the GATC motif in the, for example, long range enhancer uh, will also get methylated if they're close to the DAM uh, protein domain.